I'm not going to even blame salespeople. I'm going to blame companies and product management because they make the product the hero of the story. They make the company and the brand the hero of the story. All the literature and all the promo on their new product, they can't help but sort of like become sort of company and product centric. And mm -hmm. so this has to change back inside the organization and they have to be more than say they're customer centric. They literally have to live in and join the customer in their story. I'm Devin Reed. And I'm Sheena Badani. And you're watching Reveal, the revenue intelligence podcast powered by Gong. Keep watching here to see the full interview. Or if you like to listen to podcasts on the go, check out the links in the description below. And if you like what you hear, subscribe on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, or Spotify, or all of them. Why not? And while you're there, make sure to leave us a five-star review. We personally read every single one, and I think I speak for both of us when I say they mean the world to us. Could not agree more, Devin. Now, without further ado, here's the episode you've been waiting for. Today, we're joined by Tim Reister, who's the Chief Strategy Officer at Corporate Visions. You're also an author of multiple books. Um, pleasure to have you here at the Gong office today. Thanks, Sheena. I'm, I'm glad to be here, you and the neon, yes. And the neon. <laughs> <laughs> we do have an amazing purple and pink gong neon sign in the office for those of you who are trying to envision what the neon right, is. Right, what I was referring to. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, usually we like to kick off with a few fun questions. So tell me, what did you have for breakfast today? <laughs> uh, compliments of United Airlines. Mm -hmm. I had an egg sandwich. So just, you know, let that be what it is. It, <laughs> it, it was there and I ate it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I do like myself once in a while, uh, McDonald's Egg McMuffin, so. That would have been I don't an know if it, yeah, I'm actually. like, I don't know how the United one compares right, to Right, no, <laughs> <laughs> it was there and I ate it, yep. <laughs> um, So tell us a little bit more about your title, Chief Strategy Officer. How would you describe that in three words? <laughs> You pick the most abstract possible title and ask for three words. You pick the title. <laughs> <laughs> well, because it, it, it encompasses, like, I always say I'm in, I'm in charge of everything but responsible for nothing. Mm -hmm. But that's way more than three words. So maybe three words are like um, anything I want that's it good. to be. <laughs> okay. I mean, seriously, it's, it's, a, it's a rolling title in, in a company our size, but really it looks at let's make sure that we are – on the edge of what we need to be in terms of the next in the areas that we work in, mm -hmm. do the research behind that to find things that will put us in a unique position and then productize that and get that into the market. So all that rolls up under a chief strategy title. Perfect. So maybe taking a step uh, back from that corporate visions, for those who are not familiar, could you mm -hmm. give us a little overview of what corporate visions is all about? Yeah, the name doesn't tell you. Um, it could mean anything like my title, actually. <laughs> uh, but what it really is, is a company that is focused on improving customer conversations. And the idea there is that customer conversations are the, the differentiation anymore. Like the last bastion of differentiation is a salesperson with their lips moving. When all products and services sound alike, look alike, smell alike, read sure. alike, at some point, somebody's got to move their lips and tell an amazing story and articulate value in a way that somebody believes it and do that better than the other person. And so we focus on that moment of truth, the customer conversation. And so how we do that then is, is really look at the customer conversation as the sum of three parts, a great message or story deployed in the necessary content, assets, and tools, and then the skills to use that said story and content assets mm -hmm. in a way that makes the difference. So messages, content, and skills. I, it looks like you have a background in marketing. Maybe you could tell us a little bit more, like how did you get into corporate storytelling, if that's an okay yeah. way to position it? But um, I think it's a unique skill. It's a difficult skill. You need to know how to um, write, how to tell a good story, how to sell. You have to understand your, your clients' markets. Uh, but how did you get into this field in general? So personally, I backed into it. I'm a journalism major, and I was hired, and I'm, I'm older than everyone in the room combined, I think, but um, <laughs> uh, I backed into it. As a journalism major, I, I had an option or an opportunity to join a corporation to be what was not called then but is called now a corporate journalist. Mm -hmm. So for three years, I rode with salespeople to customer sites. So this was in the healthcare industry. They sold MRI equipment and CAT scanners and x-rays. So I'd, I'd ride with salespeople to the hospitals, I'd sometimes gown up and I'd interview doctors, radiologists, hospital administrators, and talk about um, why they chose this equipment and what it meant to them. Well, I started to hear very quickly that 
they didn't seem to recite all the features and benefits of the equipment. They started talking about their mission and the impact they were having. And it dawned on me as I'm in the field with salespeople that we want as companies to make our customers live in our story, but they live in their own story. Mm -hmm. yeah. And what, what we really need to do as companies is, is go join them in their story and help their story be better. Right. And so bringing that back from the field as a recognition that frankly, marketing content and messaging and sales conversations were too company and product centric. So mm -hmm. as a journalist out there talking to customers, like a light bulb went off that said, there's gotta be a better way. Yeah. That's interesting. I've heard um, uh, Donald Kelly, who also runs a podcast, he was he had this really good talk and he was saying the problem is that a lot of salespeople put themselves at the hero's journey. They think they're the hero. But in fact, when you know, prospects and customers are listening, they want to be the hero in that journey. And that helps them really start to understand, hey, this isn't just about you and my your product, but this is actually about me and how your product can help me get to, you know, my end resolution or, or my goal. Yeah, it's not a competition. It's not that the salesperson wants to be a hero or customers, the, the customer is the hero. So this yeah. isn't a convert, a competition. I think the problem is it's, it's I'm not going to even blame salespeople. I'm going to blame companies and product management because they make the product the hero of the story. They make the company and the brand the hero of the story. Mm -hmm. And it's all t-shirts and a rah-rah and all this. And when product launches come out, mm -hmm. the salesperson gets a box at their house and it, they open it up and confetti flies out of it. And it's <laughs> all the literature and all the promo on their new product. They can't help but sort of like become sort of company and product centric. Mm -hmm. And so they're to be customer centric and really make the customer a hero. They actually got to almost go to war against the forces of their company. And mm -hmm. so this has to change back inside the organization and they have to be more than say they're customer centric. They literally have to live in and join the customer in their story. What recommendations do you have for a rep who is trying to empathize and get in the shoes of the customer and live that story? Like what can they specifically be doing to understand that customer's reality? Well, it's interesting during a sales cycle too, because if you're in a so-called sales cycle, or now some people say the buyer's journey, we've reframed the whole thing to think of it as a deciding journey, that really the customer's on a deciding journey. They're trying to answer questions for themselves. Mm -hmm. And the salesperson can think about how to help the customer by thinking about what question the customer is asking themselves. So when you're initially talking to a customer, even though they're talking to you, does not mean that they wanna do something different. In fact, that's right. what they're actually trying to figure out hey, am I okay or do I need to be doing anything different? Do I need to change? And we always tell salespeople, the first question you have to answer for them is why should I change? Why should I do anything different? You think because they accepted a meeting with you that this is a live deal. <laughs> yeah. and, and, uh, and the reality is no, they're actually just trying to figure out, they're literally trying to figure out if they're missing anything. Right. And, and so if you start answering questions about why you and not somebody else, they're psychologically like, what? Not so mm -hmm. fast. Yeah. Um, but they might not tell you that. They'll answer your questions yeah. and you continue to think you have a deal. And then that's why we see pipelines end up in 60, 70% no decision status quo because the salesperson thought they had an active deal cycle and it turned out they didn't because sure. the customer hadn't answered the first question. Why should I change or do anything different? So the first thing we do is help a salesperson understand there are questions that they must answer and your job is actually to facilitate the answers to those questions. And they sound different than your usual sales process, which says, oh, I'm doing discovery now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you think the customer's in gathering information phase and the, really, the customer's going, should I be doing anything different? Mm -hmm. And the psychology of that changes the message and the dialogue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You talk about um, the science of messaging uh, what does that mean and how do you actually measure messaging and if it's working and if it's resonating? Yeah, the, the thing about, so the way I really think about it is that it's, it's, it's the decision science. So we're, we're studying neuroscience, behavioral economics, and social or cognitive psychology. And these are the invisible forces that shape how humans make decisions. And so if you can help marketing and sales understand how they can facilitate decision making. Mm -hmm. um, they can be more effective. And so it's not really the science of the message as much as it's the science of the decision. And then you can frame your messaging to, again, in this case, answer that why change question. Or later on, maybe they have to answer the why now question. Or very late, you have to answer the why should I pay this much question? So as the questions change, the psychology changes because you're at, in a different context in the, in the journey. 
And um, so the science comes in with understanding what are they thinking at that moment? What is that question? And then as a result of that question, what do you need to do to respond to it? And there's science behind that. There's 40 years of neuroscience and cognitive mm -hmm. psychology behind how people frame value and how they make choices. And consumer marketing and sales teams have kind of known this for a while, mm -hmm. but we've discovered B2B things that they aren't selling to humans, that somehow <laughs> when a B2B decider goes to work, they go, oh, I'm gonna check my brain at the door and I'm just gonna want acronyms and, and all alike, right? Yeah. And uh, so what we're bringing to life is no, it's still humans making decisions based on how humans make decisions. Right. How can you affect that? So that's where the science comes in. Mm -hmm. You guys have published uh, a lot of research. I'm curious if you have one that sticks out as maybe your favorite or that's maybe just been most surprising. Yeah, so I, I'm, I love them all because usually they're counterintuitive. Those we, are the best ones. Yeah, we always talk about this great intentions, wrong instincts. It's like nobody's purposefully doing things wrong. Mm -hmm. They have good intentions because it feels right. And then when we're able to show that that's the exact wrong way to do it, right. it, it it's like you have the right intentions but the wrong instincts. And, and uh, some of my favorites, like I would say the most recent one, it was my favorite because it surprised me, but it didn't surprise the scientists we work with. So we work with Dr. Zach Tormala out of Stanford in the States, and we work with Dr. Nick Lee over at Work Business School in the UK. And we did some research because people were asking us, hey, is acquisition messaging, the way you approach a prospect, the same when you're trying to expand an existing customer? Like, should mm -hmm. we use the same process, the same motion, the same approach, the same words? And we're like, we don't see why not. Well, when right. we went out and studied it, we discovered that, in fact, it's different, and it's 180 degrees different, that the psychology of an existing customer, it makes sense now when I say it, yeah. is 180 <laughs> degrees different than a prospect. Mm -hmm. When you have a prospect, your job is to displace the incumbent, to disrupt their status quo bias. So we learn how to do yeah. that through provocation and insights and all these things. You go do that to an existing customer, our research showed that they have the exact opposite reaction. They aren't mm -hmm. as likely to renew. They aren't as likely to pay more. They aren't as likely to buy the next thing. In fact, it throws the discussion open to, gee, if I have to change that much, if it's all so new, why don't I look at everybody? Sure. And so it turns out, don't disrupt, disrupt status quo <laughs> bias when you're the status quo bias. Mm -hmm. So we were like, oh my goodness because everybody's been down this path of provocation-based selling, and the scientists were like so nonplussed. They were like, yeah, you only proved what 40 years of social science has said, is that status yeah. quo bias is a thing. Yeah. But it's now uh, enabled us to write a brand new book for B2B because mm -hmm. people didn't know that. Everything that's out there is about demand gen and how do you get people to move and do this and do that. And it turns out there's a whole other conversation that needs to be had in renewals, upsells, mm -hmm. price increases, and and we even studied apologies and forgiveness. And so um, that's probably been the most exciting because it opened up a whole new world and it, it allowed us to see that too many people are approaching it as a one size fits all and it's not. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it's so much easier to expand an existing customer versus acquiring a new acquiring a new customer, but we spend this, the, you know, it's the same effort to, in terms of the messaging uh, that we invest in a new customer versus expansion. So I think that's really interesting and probably overlooked by a lot of folks. Well, what we find is that people are just using the same messaging. Like yeah. they're building a product launch, if you will, mm -hmm. yeah. and they build one message. But you, if in one case you're trying to disrupt, in the other case you're trying to defend, reinforce, and build on, there actually needs to be an entirely different spin. So when you launch a product, you should have a message for the disruption mm -hmm. and one for the, I always say, in the morning, the salesperson might have to be a disruptor. In the afternoon, they got to yeah. be a defender. Yeah. But they're representing the same product. So right. you got to equip them for both conversations. For the sales leaders who are listening and are working on their expansion sales, what's the name of this, of this book? Yeah, it's called The Expansion Sale. So well, you, we, we well weren't done. really too clever. <laughs> uh, no, thank you for promoting it there. It's literally expa The Expansion Sale, and it comes out in January from McGraw-Hill. And there's a website, expansionsale.com, and they can sure. see and read uh, a little bit about it, the testimonials and the videos. And, and we're excited about it because we think it really is a gap in the market, mm -hmm. and, and it's research-backed. So that's what we always really love about yep. it. There's data, there's yeah. research, there's frameworks, like useful frameworks, not just theory. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're, we're excited. And those are, the mo those are the moments. Those are the commercial moments where everybody's like, ah, renewals, 
upsells, price increases, and apologies. So uh, yeah, we're pretty excited about that. We're a no sponsor, no ad show, but I'm allowing the promo because I'm sitting here like, I wonder what's in this book. Like, I feel like we teed it up so well where people are like, it's different. Where can I find the answers? So I'll be checking that out for sure. All right, appreciate it. Uh, you work with companies across uh, different sizes, right? You're working with like Fortune 1000 type of companies. You're working with high growth companies. Is there anything you can tell us uh, in terms of the differences you've seen of who may be doing what better? If I'm at a high growth company, what can I be learning from um, more established companies in regards to messaging and positioning? Yeah, so that's a great question because it, there's a lot of assumptions about what might be different among company size yeah. or inside of verticals sure. or geographies. Yeah. And the thing we've learned, because we, we, we focus on decision science-based content as opposed to, let's say, best practices, decision science travels really well because everybody's engaging humans and in the human decision-making process. And it turns out that's true all over the globe. It's true by vertical and it's true by company size. But if we've seen anything is like a lot of the high growth companies, to be honest, they are more on the acquisition side and they mm -hmm. really haven't been able, and they're usually a little bit smaller and they're sometimes mm -hmm. trying to either crack into a market or go in where there's a big company that's not doing that thing very well. Mm -hmm. So they really need that very pointy, distinct point of view where people are willing to take the risk on a smaller company and and try something different. So the why change story and why do it now is really important to those smaller high growth companies. Whereas the big companies, 70 to 80% of their number in any given year is gonna come from their existing customers. Yeah, Like literally that's where the number is or isn't. And when we've been gone into those companies, we'll find ironically that 70 to 80% of their spend is on new logos. Mm -hmm. And they're just hoping and trusting that good service will make their, their customers stay mm. and grow. And, and so what we're finding is um, really great uptake um, for this expansion discussion with the bigger companies because especially as more and more big companies are trying to find recurring revenue streams, subscriptions or contracts, things that have to renew and things that have that motion. Um, so that's what we're seeing is the difference. And I think it's some of its life stage and maturity mm -hmm. um, and competitive sets. Yep. Um, or frankly, you, you can't do a lot of renewing if you don't have a lot of customers yet. So these also high growth companies, <laughs> like right, the high growth companies who are like, who have VCs or private equity firms on top of them, like they almost don't care about the profitability. They just want to see the numbers go up. Yeah, it's like yeah. a telethon, right? <laughs> Roll the timpani and see the tote board go up. But that's okay. Um, it's everybody's got what you know, they know what they need to do in the market, and um, and they they recognize what their mission is, and we've got something to tell them. Are there a couple companies that you look up to in terms of they've been able to? Uh, put together a really compelling story, especially on the expansion side. Yeah, it's, uh, uh, I'm not sure I can name these companies. Sure. It's funny when we work with these companies, um, probably the hardest thing w we get is like people don't want us to say what their names are because they consider their story and their approach this way to be their secret sauce. Because mm -hmm. when I told you that all products are the same, so the best story wins, if the best story wins, guess what I can't talk about? Their story. <laughs> sure. um, so there are some companies that are, uh, I think, understanding and doing a great job. Uh, I mean, just the, the emergence of the customer success industry in the last few years, almost didn't see that coming, right? It, it, it was like, um, here's, a, here's an entirely new title, an entirely new discipline, a brand new tech stack. And um, so I would say the companies that were seeing who are getting this are the ones who are investing in that discipline um, because they're like, okay, this is not something that can happen by accident. This has to happen mm -hmm. on purpose. Mm -hmm. So um, I would say that that's sort of the barometer we're using for folks who kind of get it on that side of the business. Uh, so I know that was a little bit evasive because I, I can't be name dropping, um, but it, no, that's, that that's what we're seeing. Yeah, yeah. Um, any tips on rolling out new messaging, new stories to the field? How can companies make that effective? Yeah, if, if, here's what we've discovered is people build their message and they build some great assets, some playbooks, yeah. and they roll it out, and, and they think they did what they were supposed to do. 
And, um, and we've had experience applying gong uh, call recording on top of clients who thought they rolled things out only to find that nobody was using it in the field. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden there was a sudden recognition that maybe it takes a little more <laughs> to create adoption and uptake in the field, right? And uh, so we've, um, uh, the bottom line is that you need to see a level of observable practice and demonstrated proficiency just to expect that if you sent it out, they're going to use it and do it well. And so the most successful companies that we see are people that roll out a new product and a new message mm -hmm. and push that out to the field and we'll work with them to uh, help frame the message and give them a little training like, oh, here's how you tell it in a disruptive style. Here's how you tell it in a reinforcer style. Mm -hmm. uh, we like to call them the expander style. Um, and, and then they must submit themselves telling that story, like record it, submit it, and against a rubric, our consultants or, or their managers will review that. Mm -hmm. And we have clients doing pass-fail, and you're supposed to certify mm -hmm. on your new product message. And so observable practice, demonstrated proficiency, and then detailed coaching and feedback. And then based on the gaps in that, We've got little videos we can send to remediate the specific areas of where they tell the story poorly. Like, do they not know how to grab attention well or do they not handle this well? Mm -hmm. So I would say that for companies thinking about distinguishing themselves with their story, they need to make sure people are owning that story. And that's, mm -hmm. that's the difference between those who are succeeding and failing with it right now because everybody can put out a new message. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But adoption and performance um, is, is not automatic. And what about like the buy-in from the top down on the story too? Like it's, I would imagine it's kind of hard for the story just to be coming in for marketing and hey, everybody on sales, you need to adopt this thing. Like this is something that has to be built in into the core of the company. It really does. Uh, if, if, if <laughs> I don't want to pick on sales enablement because they're, who, they're the people we work with all the time. But if sales enablement builds a message and rolls out a playbook, the, the market can sort of take it. Uh, the, the salespeople might take it or leave it. Um, when we work in instances where like the regional vice president is like, I'm going to expect that, and I will personally review all these mm -hmm. submissions and I will look at all the scores, um, that's awesome. We've got a very large client, large shipping company. Um, there's just a few in the world, so it's one of them. And um, <laughs> <laughs> like there's an initiative right now we're doing that is coming from the CEO. Wow. It's a competitive initiative and they're feeling some pressure, mm -hmm. and so they want a response. So built a message, some content elements, and put a little skills package together to handle this situation in the market. It's going out and everybody must demonstrate that they know it, they get it, and understand yeah. it. So what I'm finding is that instead of it, sales enablement and training now being like a catalog and a calendar that eventually people get to, these programs are being stood up in the moment they need them. So here's a product launch, let's stand up a message, content and skills program with some practice and proficiency attached to it for the next 60 days and scale this thing across the globe and get people proficient on this price increase or this competitive threat or this new product launch or whatever it is. And so I envision a future that enablement and training is gonna be very just in time versus just in case. Yeah. When you have a catalog and a curriculum and everybody's got an 18 month learning path, it's like, I'm gonna learn this stuff just in case. Sure. But if we're suffering a competitive attack or we've got an important product launch or here's a price increase that must be communicated successfully and avoiding churn, those are moments in time where the message, the content, the skills have to come together. And guess who's got eyes on those? Guess who doesn't have eyes on learning paths? Senior executives. Mm -hmm. right. Guess who has eyes on these things? Senior executives. So really, to get top-down buy-in, what you need to do is do programs that tie into top-down issues. Yeah. And I think enablement and training has got to figure out that's the way they need to deploy this stuff. And, and then you're going to get both the ear of, the eyes of, and the reinforcement and expectations of senior management. How are you measuring whether a new strategic message that you're putting out into the field was successful or not? Are you kind of looking at pre post revenue? And are you uh, taking out? Um, are you kind of like a pilot group and testing it with them first and seeing what the impact is? How are you measuring the success of that? So it is it's actually some of both. But it really even if it's a pilot group, it's still a little bit of before and a little bit after. Yeah. So um, 
we're working with a client right now who has got a team that's dedicated just to cross sell and upsell. That's all they do is they take existing accounts and try to sell them a couple extra things. And that team's results have been declining the last three years. So they got some good before. And yeah. so we're helping them build uh, a message around some uh, of the core upsell add-on type products. And we're going to do that in a region. Hmm. And we're going to take 17 of these people who have that role. And we're going to give them a new message. And we're going to teach them on how to tell that story. And they're going to practice and certify on it. And then we're going to turn on Gong to record their calls to make sure they are doing it. Sure. And then we're going to look at their performance. And mm -hmm. we can look at what they were doing before because the trajectory has been down. And we ought to be able to see pipeline go up. We ought to be able to see deal size go up, penetration rates go up. That's the beauty of doing programs that are tied to these strategic initiatives. They have metrics inherently. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When you have learning paths, generalized skills training, everybody's like, what's the ROI on that? It's going to be abstract. But right. if you stand up a program on this price increase and on this issue, on that issue, and the next issue, like those are tied to things that you can literally watch the meter. Mm -hmm. And so that's what's exciting about this is that enablement training and marketing, when we do it this way, just in time versus just in case, the metrics are built in. You don't, Nobody's got to guess and nobody's got to obfuscate uh nobody's got to cobble together it's mm -hmm. you're gonna know yeah, <laughs> right that's, that's so great. and i think that's exciting that's where we should all want to be totally yeah, yeah i'm i'm always curious like i've read some of your guys's research um kind of one of our themes is like the unanswered questions right they plague sales teams everywhere um instead of the you know maybe unanswered questions that plague your sales team kind of what are the unanswered questions you're looking to solve with like your current research if you're able to share yeah, so our current research, like the one that's literally happening now as we speak, is um, which type of visual will have the greatest impact in remote online meetings? So as mm -hmm. more companies move to inside sales, mm -hmm. that means a lot more phone and web meetings. Well, it turns out that even outside sellers, on average, 50% of their sales touches are remote. So here we are in an online meeting environment. Let's, it just is. Phone calls and, and, and web conferences. And a lot of things that have been taught to salespeople have been around stand and deliver type techniques. Like when you're in the room mm -hmm. and even when you get trained on it, you have like little role play sessions. But here you are sitting behind a box. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and so if the best story wins and now the storyteller is obscured by something, like whatever shows up on your screen can destroy, utterly destroy everything you're trying to do. And what we find is like in a room, you could put a slide up because you're standing there and you don't have to change a slide for minutes. Yeah. But you need to change a slide every five, 10, 15 seconds, give or take. There needs to be something happening, whether you're annotating on that slide mm -hmm. or you're animating building something on that slide. So we're gonna test like, like how do the visuals have to move? What types of visuals get the best response? We'll test simple whiteboard visuals versus traditional stock photography and bullets against really vivid imagery with cool animation. So we've mm. got multiple types of imagery. And what we're gonna do is take the same exact story, same voiceover mm -hmm. recorded, and the only thing that's gonna change is the visual and we'll put people in the different test groups and we'll see how intensely they respond to the story they saw. And what we'll know in the difference is the only thing that was different was the visual, the type of visual, and sure. the elements or concepts that were used in the visual. Mm -hmm. Our goal being to come back to the online meeting audience and say, this is what your visual has to do. Right. And so that's going to be exciting because, honestly, if the story is what separates you and, and now you are no longer a factor, it's just the thing they're staring at, that's got to really rock. Yeah. And we don't want people to be guessing, and uh, uh, we, we want it to rock, not be schlock. Um, I don't know, that's tough, but uh, <laughs> the idea is that, I mean, people are unwittingly probably really harming themselves in what they're sharing over yeah. WebEx or, you know, you name it. And so we want to have a definitive answer and help people figure that out and be more successful. Do you have any early hypotheses on oh, what's going to come out yeah. of that? <laughs> <laughs> I'm really no, no, eager to see so, this. <laughs> I mean, my personal, like, even when I keynote, I will put a, a, an easel pad up and I'll ask for an iMag camera and I will do an entire keynote with flip charts and markers because I'm a big believer in simple and concrete. The decision-making part of our brain is very simple and concrete. And many times our PowerPoint slides um, take abstract, complicated topics and only make them more abstract and yeah. complicated. So whatever it's going to be, it's going to be something that makes abstract, complicated, simple and concrete. So I know that. Mm -hmm. um, what I do know is also that we've done the survey in the market, maybe 
12 or 13% of companies say, you know, I think we might do whiteboarding of some sort. Now that it goes online and remote, people are going to be even less likely to draw on right. their iPads yeah. or on their, yeah. So we know the voice is going to be PowerPoint. So now it's going to be a question of what type of PowerPoint. So we know it's going to have to be dynamic. We, we know that it's going to have to convey certain things. So we have like the three C's. It has to have context for urgency. Mm -hmm. No one moves to something else if they don't believe their current content context is at risk. Sure. Right? So we have to have that. And so you have context for uh, urgency. Then you have to have contrast for value. Mm -hmm. Nobody sees value unless they can compare it to what they're doing today and what you're talking about. And if there isn't enough contrast, nobody takes the risk of moving to get the same thing. So mm -hmm. whatever the visual is, you have to have clear contrast, context for urgency, contrast for value, and then concrete. It has to look like it's doable. And sometimes the visuals make things look really hard. So it's going to have to be some sort of very simple, concrete visual that helps the person who's watching go, I could retell and I, I, could, I could probably redraw that story if I just had that slide. So context, contrast, and concrete. We know those three things are essential. Mm -hmm. And they usually don't show up in stock photography and bullet points. Mm -hmm. So somehow it's going to be those things conveyed in, in dynamic visual form. Yeah. yeah, I know a lot of sales presentations where you take your product and you make it into some sort of analogy, then you look at the screen and it's a secondary analogy on top of the analogy. So if you're just looking at it, it's kind of like, wait, what are we actually really talking about here? <laughs> yeah, when something's abstract and complicated and then you pick an abstract metaphor or right. analogy, you've just abstracted the abstraction. It's a little inception action And somebody's action like, action I don't on. know why they picked a bald ego. Well, I would have put a Formula One race car on there. And they've yeah. lost, you've right. lost them at that point. So yeah, you know, what's very important is, and the difference there is, Use, don't use cliche metaphors, use powerful analogies. Right, right. And what you want to do is pick an analogy of something they've done before, a decision they've made before that's similar to this one. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because the one thing you want to do is make the brain feel comfortable with the decision. And you want them when they're like, after they leave that meeting and they're, that's, I always call that point A. They move to point B where the decision is, they got to be able to recall it. Mm -hmm. And sometimes a really well-placed analogy where they're at this decision, oh, we've made this decision before in accounting and you know, so mm -hmm. there's a similar sort of thing, right? So this is the ERP of sales or whatever it is. Right. right and, right. and all of a sudden people go, Oh, and, or this is uh, this is the iTunes library of content management. So there's some things that allow people to be better at recall that are really powerful analogies, but it's usually when it's a, a, a similar analogy of some of a decision they've taken successfully and safely before. Mm -hmm. right. um, that's why icebergs, for analogies and metaphors suck. Yeah. <laughs> or Mount yeah. Everest. Yeah. People have not really yeah. climbed Mount Everest and if they think about it, it's hard. So yeah. don't tell them it's even harder because <laughs> who wants to even try? <laughs> and 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 the analogy of the iceberg, you know, there's never good news where an iceberg's in fall. So. Exactly, right. <laughs> so not only are they cliche, they look hard and they look daunting and and um, so uh, if you want somebody to make a decision and do something, those are bad. Mm -hmm. yeah. It is mm -hmm. bad. We should just eliminate those right now. I love it. <laughs> Uh, we've touched on um, kind of this new era of selling, which is primarily remote. Um, and along with that comes a ton of data um, and analytics that can be run now on sales. Do you think this is a positive thing for the industry? Is it negative, neutral, uh, an opportunity? How do you view it? Because I'm a science guy uh, versus like, I love bringing the science to the art and I love repeatability and scalability, right? I think this is important. Um, it used to be organizations were very dependent on um, what sort of magic or fairy dust or voodoo was going on out in the field, right? And, yeah. and uh, you had no way of knowing. And then we put CRM out there. And then what you realize is nobody put anything in the CRM until they had to. Right. And because uh, nobody wanted that much inspection. And so it was like, eh. so um, what I find, well, I, I believe it's better. I know some salespeople would say it's not, but I think if you think on the whole for the organization, it's better. Now, that said, I think there's maybe some good data and some bad data. Some data can make you lazy. Other data can make you better. Mm -hmm. And you an if, example? Well, I mean, so let's say if you get some, some predictive or intentional type data that uh, this person should be in the market looking for something, mm -hmm. you might be too assumptive when you call them. Sure. One, then creeping them out, or two, being lazy in doing the work you should be doing because mm -hmm. you think they're already in the market. I'm not saying people are gonna do that, but the risk is there sure. that, that I think people are gonna be too assumptive and, and, and just kind of lose best, like good practices in the way they should tell their story and engage the story. Mm -hmm. um, 
the good data, uh, and I'm sitting here with Gong, um, uh, is I think when you can inspect the artful part, the conversation, and find things that have greater impact and be able to repeat those things or find out who is or isn't using your messaging sure. and then be able to show them with performance metrics that it makes a difference. Um, I think those are really, that's yeah. really good news is because the, the thing about conversations where we've tried to make the story science, we haven't been able to make sales uh, adoption a science. Mm -hmm. And I think that yeah. has to happen. So that's where the good news is. We're really excited about that. Uh, the concept of conversation or revenue intelligence, I think is very important. I just think that we don't want to assume that the data, one, will require less capable sellers. Oh, we have all this data. Right. It should be a slam dunk. Right. Right. So not only do we maybe not get the assumptive seller, now we have everybody saying selling should be easy yeah. and it should just happen. And I think, so you could on one hand have a repercussion from a management standpoint or from the sales standpoint. So we'll see. I, uh, I think the sellers that remain are, are going to have to be better at their craft. Yeah. And this will help if, if, right. if used wisely. I always say they used to have to be product experts, but now sellers can't be product experts because your website is up to date faster and more complete than you ever can be. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. then I'm like, sellers then could win by being process experts. But now customers are disrupting the process. They're yeah. coming in and get the information all over the place. Yeah. You enter and you don't know what question they're answering or where they're at. And then they got 10 point six people you got to convince the process <laughs> is you're not in charge of the process anymore so that's not yeah. your gift to sales success and then I, I i always said it was the proposition like you know even the story now a lot of companies are putting out pretty good messaging yeah mm -hmm. so the difference we feel like the pinnacle this is going to is the person who can facilitate the decision the person who can like make meaning for the customer. And you do that by being able to help them answer the question. So we've kind of, of course, because it's our opinion, moved on from product and process and proposition to persuasion and, and decision science, facilitating the mm -hmm. questions and answering those questions, literally enabling the buyer. Mm -hmm. And um, those that's a, that's a mad skill set to have. And uh, so I, I think if we get too comfortable in thinking that this is all going to be analytics and data-driven and, and we don't need really superior conversationalists, we're going to be kidding ourselves. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I know Gartner has put out some research on that front as well, is that we're overwhelmed with data and what the role of s the best sales folks now is, is to help guide that decision-making process. Yeah, we'd like to think we always knew that because <laughs> guiding decision-making means helping them answer their questions, like yeah. literally facilitating the answer to questions. And what we know is it's not one big question, should I buy or not buy, it's why should I change? Mm -hmm. Why should I do it now? Why should I pick you, not everybody else? Why should I pay right, that much? Right. And then on the customer side, it's why should I stay with you? Why should I do more with you? Why should I forgive you? And so <laughs> it's, you. It exactly, we couldn't agree more with where Gartner's research has gotten to and it sort of feels like it reinforces this idea that they're struggling to make decisions. They lack the confidence, but it is a series of decisions. So this is what you need to master is the ability to engage and help them answer those questions. So we're, we're kind of excited. We think it's sort of all of our science research about decision science and conversations is now intersecting what the data from the folks like Gartner are saying. Yep. Um, what do you think sales executives, the number one thing sales executives should think about in 2020? You know, I think sales leaders have a tendency to kind of like try, like a, a look for a magic bullet. Like this year, yes. this is what we're going to do. And everybody's going to go through this and that's going to make the difference. And I think that is, is complete hogwash. Um, there's different sellers and different territories require and have different needs. For example, don't teach this whole group to negotiate if they can't even fill their pipeline. So do something for those that cohort who can't fill their pipeline. And yeah, there's a cohort over here who, are, who close deals, but they're unscrupulous discounters. Give them what they need. Mm -hmm. But there's somebody over here whose entire territory is dependent on renewals. And so they don't need any prospecting training or mm -hmm. provocative selling training. Sure, they, they, sure. Need, they need to figure out how to be great at renewals. And then there's another territory where there's like no new logos. It's pretty saturated. You've done pretty well there. That person has to understand how to be excellent at upselling and cross-selling. So here's what's available. So situational content and situational skills training is available. KPIs are available through all the tools that are out there. Mm -hmm. um, now you need to take a more diligent 
you, uh, approach to looking at your team and their territories and saying, here's what they need this year because this is how this person will get to their number and this person will get to their number. Like I'd recommend managers look at their team of 10 because that's usually what they manage and figure out based on their KPIs, where do they fall? Here's my two at suck at pipeline. These are two at suck at closing. These are the three that suck at negotiations, right? And and then make sure they get what they need because mm -hmm. the totality of your number is going to be based on those people getting better at the thing they're weak at, not just giving them all the same thing and hoping for the best. Right. So that's what I think is it's it's no it's not a silver bullet. You got to be just the beauty is we have the data and the technology to deploy and really the content chunked anymore that can help people where they need the help. I'm working on a list of analogies that we should leave in 2019. I think you're the person to find the opposite of the silver bullet. Maybe in 2020, you can come up with the yeah, opposite. Yeah, I can't believe I used it, <laughs> given the, <laughs> that. Uh, it wasn't a knock. That one hadn't made the list, but I think you're the right person to say, yeah, maybe, you know, don't look for the silver bullet. Do this totally other thing instead. Does this generation even remember werewolves and silver bullets? Uh, that's right, I, yeah. You know what I mean? When yeah. you say it's silver bullet, I don't think right? anybody even, right. Yeah, it's yeah. the only thing that can kill a werewolf. Um, I'm so, a millennial and I got it, so I think we're okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's always my gauge. Thanks. All right. Um, well, last, last question for you. Describe sales in one word. I love that everyone, if you didn't hear that, everyone takes a deep sigh at the end before they answer this question. <laughs> um, psychologists. Mm -hmm. um, being able to really understand and empathize with what's going on and then be able to come back with something meaningful and relevant that they can do for them. And uh, so, yes, I would say shrink. <laughs> <laughs> just you know i don't that that's probably cliche too but uh, yeah i mean uh, thanks for that i hadn't pondered that at all before this but i really think that's what it's going to take and that's why it's that's why it's going to take advanced skills to mm -hmm. do it because th if we think we're going to have fewer sellers or they're all going to be inside they're going to have probably the most important job mm -hmm. which is to sort out the commoditization of every market that we're and they are in and do something to help the customer figure it out. And you gotta you gotta have the ability to to work both sides of it, right? So yeah. yep, I stick with my word. That's my final answer, psychologist. Accepted. That's well, Tim, thank you for making some time for us during Dreamforce Week. You absolutely brought it and uh, it was a pleasure having you. Thanks, appreciate it. And uh, yeah, uh, me and what, 130,000 friends here in San Francisco this week. Just so a few. Thanks for just, you know, this little moment together. You're absolutely <laughs> welcome. Thanks so much. 